Welcome to another main SBDC event. Today we will be covering how to boost customer engagement on your webinar. I was going to say something along the lines of today we'll be learning how to make chicken pot pies and then tell you it was April Fool's, but I never came up with a good enough joke to uh, land, so I'll just tell you my intentions. Uh, we are joined by the lovely Corey Zimmerman today from the Wander Web. She is a digital marketing specialist with the main SBDC right now. So she's working with our business advisors and the clients to cover really specific marketing information. And if you are not familiar with the main SBDC, we are a free confidential business advising program that is here to support the small businesses of Maine in any way that we can. So if you are not a client, you should definitely reach out for advising. Uh, there's a big orange button on our website that makes it very easy to sign up. All of that information will also be in a follow-up email that you will receive from me after today's event. That will include a recording today's session. Um, and any resources that we hand out. So I think that there's like a freebie at the end that we'll make sure is included as well. And our contact information. So you'll be able to request advising right in that email. A little bit of housekeeping. If you have any questions at all, please go ahead and submit them in the chat. Also feel free to introduce yourself. This is a really great time to network with other organizations throughout Maine. So let us know maybe what area of the state you're in or your industry. If you have a website already, uh, throw it in there. Um, and then what are, what are you struggling with with your website? What's, an, what's something that you're having a hard time with? Let us know because you'd be surprised how common we think our own problems are. We don't realize how common they are with everyone. So you can get that little bit of camaraderie in the chat as well. Um, otherwise, I think I will pass it over to Corey. Oh, I muted her though, so I will unmute her. Thank you. I appreciate that, Kelsey. Um, my husband just left, so, uh, and he was making a lot of man noise, so I appreciate being muted. Okay, good morning, everybody. My name is Corey Zimmerman. I am the owner of a web design and digital strategy agency in Bangor called Wander Web. And I, prior to starting my agency, I had worked in the healthcare sector for around 20 years uh, as a project manager doing process improvement analytics and system integration. And so I sort of have adapted all, all things about owning an agency along with those, those skills that I had beforehand. So a lot of business strategy actually goes into what I do. So we'll talk about some of those things today. But really what I wanted to talk to you about is how to engage your customers better on a website. A lot of people, um, business owners, as they create their website, they present the information as though they're telling instead of pulling people in and making the customer the hero. And so we'll give you some tips and tricks today and I'll show you some specific successful examples as well as a before and after. So what is website engagement? Website engagement is when somebody arrives on your website they start to read it and they begin to click through your website and actually read the other content throughout your website and eventually become a customer. So if the person who's on the other end of your website is actively learning about your business, you've won half the battle, especially if you're telling a good story. So we'll talk about a lot of those things today. But one of the things that I do want to point out is we're going to have a couple SEO minutes today or search engine optimization. I'm going to keep it super high level, super easy to understand, and just give you some low hanging, actionable, deliverable fruits that you can take care of in order to, if you do these things, then a lot of the other parts of search engine optimization will follow. So SEO can be really, really complex, or you can just look at the, that 
you know, the 80-20 rule, if you do 80% um, of your effects come from 20% of your initiatives. So we're gonna focus on that 20%, okay? And if I'm speaking too quickly, I have only had coffee yet today. So if I am speaking too quickly, please let me know that it's normal. I'm a fast talker, uh, side, side parting, um, <laughs> middle-aged <laughs> coffee loving woman. So that's, that's what you're getting today. So let's start. The first thing I want to tell you is when people come to your website, what they look at are first your images, okay? And so it's so important that your images have to be good. They cannot suck. And I can't tell you how many websites I go to and I see poorly pixelated images. They're not um, the right size for the website, uh, the, the screen that they're on. Um, just take a look at your images. There are some great free stock images out there and you can use your own images. If they're not good quality, I suggest making them smaller. Uh, and that's a little trick that you can use or with overlays, things like that. But really, I understand when starting a business, your finances are tight. That's just part of starting a business. So you can look at some of the ways to get some better photography with college students uh, or some talented people that you know that might have a skill with photography. But something that I've suggested to some customers that I work with that are creating websites or wanting to, you know, get photography on a shoestring is just do a consultation with a photographer and have them come in and show you how to do photographs for your specific industry. So for example, if you're a stained glass company, have a photographer come in or somebody that has the skill and just show you the setup and then just keep that setup. And that's your go-to place to always do your stained glass photography so that your lighting is good, you're not casting shadows and your size of your images are appropriate for your website. This is probably the most important thing I would say is because people read with their, you know, eat with their eyes on a website as well as in the kitchen, okay? So your images have to be good. Oh, also just to go back, there are, you know, YouTube videos also that you can watch on how to take, take some images and those are free. And I send people, I use YouTube all the time if I forget how to do something because there are so many skills out there that you need to have as a web designer. And also there's so much new things happening. For example, Google just rolled out Google Stories. And so I don't know anything about them. So I just use YouTube and I, I got on there and made it my business to learn that myself so that I can help my clients. All right, so the next thing that people look at, the first thing they look at is your images. The second thing they look at is your written content. And one of the things that I just wanna point out is when people are reading online, which they do now all the time, we're in online world now, they read, there's an, a reason that arrow is there, they read down, not across, okay? So when people are reading a website or your, your ebook or whatever, they're not reading across as though you would be reading a paper or a magazine. What they do is they skim the content and decide if it's worth reading and get try to get the gist of the content from um, the, the visual skimming of the content. And then they decide if they're going to go back and read it. So the first thing I would recommend is write, considering that people read down and not across. People do read left to right. But <laughs> the thing I often recommend to people is throw all the rules of grammar out the window. They're gone. So where you would normally uh, just emphasize something when you're speaking, make that bold. If you, or, or use italics. If you naturally pause while you're reading something out loud, that's where you would do maybe a paragraph or a page break to make the content flow really well. And I'm going to show you an example. Uh, we're going to pop out of this. And I'm going to show you an example with, uh, this is Whitney Wreath, a website that I designed. And David Whitney, the owner of Whitney Wreath, has a really compelling story. And I actually submitted his story. It's just going to move a little slow because we're on Zoom. Um, I actually submitted his story because it's such a strong one to some uh, public relations and news agencies. But do you see how when you're reading his website, you can sort of just look at a couple bold points. You know, you know it's David's story, you know his role. He talks about how he started, 
you know, that it pulls on the heartstrings a little bit and it wrapped it up. And then people will decide, okay, well, this is worth going back and reading because I, you know, quickly can skim the content and decide if it's worth my time. So often, so I'm seeing poor images often, right? We talked about that, but often I see people pack copy in really, really tight. And they also put it across the entire width of the web page. And something that we want to definitely minimize is eye fatigue. And because people read down and then left to right, if, you if you're having to look across the entire page to read the, the content, then your, your um, customer's eyes are going to get tired and they're going to leave your site. And you might not think it's a big deal, but any small thing like that will have somebody leaving your site. It's so easy to click off a website and go somewhere else, okay? So making it easy for your customer to do what they're supposed to do is the most important thing for you to remember on your website. Does that make sense? Can I see some nods? Okay, cool. <laughs> All right. So we're going to go back to this window. Perfect. Okay. So the third thing. So we've got the images have to be good. The copy has to be compelling and written in a way that people can skim it and decide if they want to read it. And the third is make it easy for people to know what they're supposed to do. So again, I see this on the digital version of this every day when I work with clients. And so what I would ask you to do is to look at this slide and decide on here which one is the, the one that's the most important thing to do. Is there any way to tell? You can't tell what the priority is here, right? So think about that with your call to action or the buttons on your website. So every page on your website should only have one primary call to action. All right, so you want to have a clear call to action. So your overall website has a goal. The goal might be to get people on your mailing list. The goal might be to sell a product. The goal might be to just have people learn about you. So you're thinking about that when you're starting your website. And then as you lead them through the storybook of your website with every page being a page on the story, you really want to make the call to action very clear, okay? So I'm going to, again, I like to show and show as well as tell. So I'm going to show you an example of how to make something really clear on a website. So I'm going to bring up, uh, I don't know if, if any of you have heard of Valentine Footwear, but it's a boutique footwear brand in Bangor. And so when you come to this website, you know immediately you're at a shoe store, okay? And they want you to shop online. You can either shop in line or book a sh a in store shopping. So do you see there's no links to Instagram, there's no links to Pinterest, there's no links to Facebook. All of those things are down here in her footer because people are going to naturally look there to get them, okay? But really, everything that you need is here. And you can also see her website is written to skim down and not across, okay? So do you see how that's a really good user experience? And I'm going to show you maybe a, a poor user experience in a few minutes, but um, it's not terrible, but it's one that could be improved with some of these tips. Okay, so the next thing, so we talked about making sure that your images look good. We talked about making your copy easy to read and compelling. We've talked about making sure people know what they want to do. The other is give people place for their eyes to rest. And a rookie website design mistake is often smooshing everything together really, really tight. And what, you, what we're finding is that that drastically decreases the user experience. So I'd encourage you to break up your content and think of all the people that are skimming and really need to have space for their eyes to rest. So make sure your content is, the fonts are large enough to read and uh, that they're not smooshed together as far as um, with the part and in height, okay? Okay. So there's a Z on this screen, and there is a definite method to my madness here. What we're going to be talking about is eye mapping, all right? So where do you think, and I'd like everyone to put something in the chat, 
Now consider this as a website, a web page, a landing page that someone let so your homepage, okay? So consider this your homepage. What is the most important part of this homepage? Just pick a spot. Is it the middle? Is it this part? Is it the upper left-hand corner? Is it over here? And write what you think the, the best spot is, the highest value spot in the chat, please. And Kelsey, I'd love to know if we're having any trends, seeing any trends. People think it's the middle. I also thought it was the middle. Okay, yeah. A lot of centers. Yep. I hear a lot of lefts. Okay. All Yellow right. Yellow on top left. Ready for the answer? Mm -hmm. Okay. So what happens, and we're going to talk about eye mapping right now. So we're going to talk about the way that people's eyes work when they look at a website. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is probably the most valuable piece of information I'm going to give you today is when people look at a website, what they do is they start up here in the upper left-hand corner. People that speak English anyway, right? That read left to right. So they start in the upper left-hand corner and they scan across and they pause here, all right? Then they zip down across and they scan across the bottom. And so everybody does a Z. So the reason there's a Z on this page is I want you to remember when you're putting your content on your web page to zigzag it, okay? Think about where the eyes go. All right, do you want the answer for where the highest value part of your website is? It's that upper right-hand corner. Which nobody said. <laughs> so what not happened? A single, not a single person guessed that, wow. <laughs> So what happens is people look here to start, but their eyes rest here, okay? So you want your call to action, your most important thing, your button that you want people to do to be in the upper right-hand corner of your website. That is the most important part. So if you want them to call me, call you. That's where your phone number goes. If you want them to click through to your shop, that's where your shop now button is, okay? And that stays on every page of your website because it's on your menu. So you want to make sure the upper right-hand corner of your website represents the most high value action that you're asking people to do. So this guy's shaking maracas for a reason. So again, I'm going to show you a couple of these websites that we looked at. So let's look at summer, all right? So you come onto the website, you scan across and boop, there you are, a shopper online store. Then you scan down, you see, okay, Valentine footwear, and then you do your Z, boop, boop. All right, that's done mindfully. That's not by mistake. All right, let's go to Whitney, and we're gonna go to their homepage. And by the way, don't bother putting a homepage in your menu because your logo will always link back to your homepage. So save that menu item for something more high value. All right, so we're scanning across. We know we're at Whitney Reese. We're, you know, we see your menu items. Oh, they want me to order a wreath. Main balsam wreath shop now. They're beautiful, fragrant, and I get free shipping. Okay. So just keeping that in mind when you're designing your website. And as you scan down, just keep in mind that you want to break things up. See all the white space. It's easy to rest the eye. Some calls to action here. You can actually go in and see their different products in a shop now. The other thing is I do see occasionally is people don't put enough buttons on their website. Really pretty much every scroll, you should be seeing a button or some sort of way to do, to follow your action. Okay. All right, back to Morocco Man. How are we doing so far? All right. So now we're going to get into a little bit of search engine optimization. And I'm just gonna keep it super easy and tell you a few low hanging fruit, things that you need to do to make SEO your friend. All right, so <sighs> there are three things that I recommend for you to do for on-page SEO. The, all of the other things we talked about are user experience and user experience lends to search engine optimization because the things that Google does is it measures how long people are staying on your site. Google wants to give people the best results for their search engine inquiry. So if somebody types in we, um, balsam wreath into a website and it takes them into a search engine and the search engine takes them to a website that they don't stay on for very long, Google's going to take note of that and say, oh, 
Well, when people type in balsam wreath, that's not really a good answer for them. So I'm probably not going to make that high on my priority list for next time. So that's how Google thinks about search engine optimization, because Google wants everybody going to Google to look for things. So they want to give the best answers, right? So all of those user experience things that we just talked about were all around keeping somebody on your website for a little bit longer. Okay, and these are the things that you can do for your on page search engine optimization. So we talked about user experience and these are just some of the things that you would do for making sure people are finding you on Google by making sure the right words are on your website. And the ways you can do that are knowing what your keywords are. And you might hear the term keywords, but I, from a web design perspective, think of them a little bit differently because what we're looking for are the keywords that people type into the search engine. So for example, I've worked with a coach before and I said, we need to have best life coach in Maine somewhere in your website. And she's like, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to do that. And I said, yes, but that's what people type into a, a browser when they're looking for a life coach in Maine. That's the most common thing that people type in. So how can we fit something like that in? to make sure that people, that Google, the Google monster reads those words and munches them up and knows that they're there so that they can send people to that website. So what you do on Google is if you're looking for your keywords, we're gonna go back and we're going to go to Google. So if we're looking for um, a life coach, all right, I don't type any better than this normally, so I'm not even gonna pretend it's because you're watching. All right, so you've got life coach in Maine. This is what we typed in. What I want you to do is you start to use your imagination. Like what would people type in if they're looking for me? And this is great, all of this. And you can see what comes up and take note. I'm going to talk about meta descriptions in a minute. And this is a meta description here, okay? This, this sub content here, this is a meta description. This is a meta description. This is a meta description, okay? But what I do is, and there's a lot more to this, but Scroll down to the bottom and Google is going to tell you people that type that in, what else are they typing in? All right. So, and you can then type in other things that might, people might be looking for, but just take note of these and write them on your list. So um, they might type in, I need a life coach. All right. So take, see all those keywords are popping up and they're highlighted here. Sorry, I'm, I see you looking in coaching, coach, coaching. So those are words you just want to make sure are in your written content, right? Okay. And then you can just scroll to the bottom and use my hack. Look at this. Easy peasy. There's your keywords. Free. There's other F words that are great, but free is my favorite one. Okay. So we're going to go back here. So we talked about keywords, okay? That's how you find your keywords. You wanna put them in your headlines and sprinkle them liberally throughout your site. Do not keyword stuff. Google is smart enough with its artificial intelligence to know that if you have life coach in one place and then life mentor in another, that they kind of go together. I'm just, I don't know if life mentors one, I'm just making stuff up, but Google's smart enough to read across your site and um, use um, regressive logic. Okay, so then you want to also put your keywords in your meta descriptions and every page should have its own meta description. And if you don't know how to make a meta description for your website, just go to YouTube and say, how do I make a meta description on WordPress? Or how do I make a meta description on Squarespace? And it will show you how to do it. Boom, you've, you're done. Okay, keep it easy. And then you also want to tag your images and give them alternative tags, as are, or they're called alt tags. And so let me give you an example of a alt tag. So again, we're looking for search engine optimization. So if someone is, so say if someone is looking for a scarf, you sell scarves and you, someone is looking for scarves online, right? And they see a scarf they like, and this is sort of, okay, here we go, down here. So do you see how they're tagged? Scarves for fall and winter, classic cashmere scarf. They're describing what is in the image. And the reason for that is 
for search engine optimization purposes, if someone is looking at images, which a lot of people do on, on Google, look at images and they see an image they like and they click on it because it's been tagged appropriately, then they'll end up on your website. That's how image SEO works. And so what I like to do is tag the images and the alt tag with a description of what's in the image. So you might say, um, you might be looking at New England style and looking at images. And in this image, I would type in red chair, right? Blue couch, console table, for example. And then you could even put in the name of the designer or um, the, the website or the, the business that you can get those from, okay? So that's how you sort of tag images in order for people to find them in photos and then click through to your website. That's how image optimization works. And I'm not trying to give you specific tools as far as do this. It's more giving you the logic behind it so you can take this information and use it um, with critical thinking moving forward. Okay. <laughs> All right, so. We also need to make sure your website is mobile friendly. Google this year is prioritizing two things for search engine optimization. They have over 200 metrics that they look at for search engine optimization. But this year, their top priorities are making sure that pages load quickly, so site speed. And I'm not going to give you a lot of tips on that. Honestly, if you really have issues with site speed, you really should go to a developer um, that's something that requires a lot of technique, technology knowledge, and back-end web development inf um, information like shrinking image sizes, but keeping them big enough so that they look good on your website. There's, there's really a lot to it. I'm just giving you that as information, but making sites mobile friendly is pretty easy to do these days. So again, most of the time, if you use a theme, your website will automatically be built in a mobile friendly option in a mobile friendly manner, my apologies, pardon me, but um, just make sure that you look up your website on your phone and make sure that everything is readable because what you might find is that when something looks good on a wide screen and screens are really wide these days um, because of the style of the desktops, right? And then you also have to think about laptops, which are a little bit narrower, tablets, with are, which are even more narrow, and now phones, which are like super narrow. So you might find that you want to change things up so that if it's showing on a mobile device, say the button that normally you'd put on the left because that's where the eye falls, on a mobile device, you want it in the middle or things like that. So you would just sort of tweak that based upon what you're seeing and use your common sense. How are we doing so far? Any questions? Have I lost anybody? Okay, cool. I know it's a lot of information. So we already talked about time on site. We, you know, talked about making the images good, labeling your um, site appropriately. So when people land on your site, they know they're supposed to be there. And I'm going to give you an example of a fail. And this was my fail, actually. So I designed a website for a, um, a home interior decorator. And we labeled a website page. Ha, um, what are those dolls that people have there? Uh, American Girl dolls. So it was a, a room that was decorated as an American for a little girl with American Girl dolls. So the room's theme was American Girl, right? And so we labeled that page American Girl Room, right? And so later when we looked at the analytics, people were coming to that page and leaving immediately. There was a lot of abandonment of the website based upon them landing on that page. And it was one of the primary pages people were landing on. So it was getting found by SEO perspectives, but it wasn't what people were looking for. When people were looking for an American girl room, they were looking actually to shop for American girls. So we just had to go back and re refigure that page and rename it and tag it a little bit differently so that the people that arrived on that page understood that they were going to an interior decorators website, not a shopping site. So that's an example of tagging that, you know, kind of went, went rogue and we were able to fix it, thank goodness. And that's why analytics is important. All right, so I'm going to show you a site that I recently did a critique on. 
And this website is Heart of Ellsworth. And I'm actually going to bring them up. They are, let's excuse me for a second. So they are right here. Nope, here. Okay, so this website is Heart of Ellsworth. And they are um, an Ellsworth based nonprofit that their priority is really having people enjoy the downtown area. So what I would ask you is when you come to this website and look really quickly, you because people give you three seconds, that's it. Do you know what the website is about? Right? Okay. So, and let's go back to eye mapping. Okay, so people are going to start up here. Okay, so the, they might skim down a little bit and see this, but really, shop local Ellsworth today and every day. Click here for a full listing of downtown merchants. So you can do that, but is that the priority of the site? Because she's taking them really away from the goal of the website, right? Which is to get them engaged in all of this stuff. And then when you look at the menu, you're, you're like, oh, okay, there's a lot going on here. They've got events. So like, what, what, what is going on? Like, what do I do? Look at how busy this menu is, right? So there's so many ways that you could lose your customer. Now, if from a user experience standpoint, if I came here and I saw these poorly, poorly photographed images um, and a busy menu, I probably would just pop off it, right? I probably wouldn't stay on this website. And then you scroll down and see how the font goes, the text goes all the way across. It's just so much work. They, they're asking the customer to do so much here, so much work, all right? So if I were designing this website, this is what I would do is I would do something like this. Okay, so Heart of Ellsworth, information about Experience Ellsworth, get involved in news and events, and that could be their blog, okay? Down here, you've got Shop, Play, Dine, Discover, Downtown Ellsworth. It's exactly, you know exactly what you're supposed to do here. So do you see how simplicity makes it so much better for the user and they don't pop off your site? Now, I just want to point out that this isn't downtown Ellsworth. I'm pretty confident that this is Quebec, <laughs> but this is an inspiration that I would give them to use for creating their site. And I would recommend that they get content like this for me to add to their website. Okay. So we're going from this. And I've taken all of these webs, the, these menu items and consolidated them to this. Different world, right? Does that make you want to go to Ellsworth? It makes me want to go. So, all right. Okay. So what questions do you have? It's time for questions. All right, well, we've got one question. So everyone else feel free to submit questions in the chat. But Casey was wondering, you said Google's prioritizing two things. Number one was load speed, but what was number two? Mobile optimization. Mobile optimization. So you, yeah, so you already covered that pretty much. Mm -hmm. uh, awesome. Well, everyone feel free to submit any questions. If you, could give everyone like one homework task. Sure. What should everyone do? If they only do one thing after this session, what should they do? I would recommend simplifying your menu and putting that call to action in the upper right-hand corner. That would be my one recommendation. I yes. am totally- so We actually got a question oh, okay. Okay. clarifying that. How did you consolidate the menu on that part okay. of Ellsworth? That. Yep. It's, I guess it says, are the same number of pages available under the four categories or did you further consolidate it? Right. So yes, what I did, so I further consolidated that. So for example, for Experience Ellsworth, what I had would recommend for them is something like, I wonder if it's on this website, um, something like this, mm -hmm. maybe up and down instead of side to side, and that said shop dine, um, explore. And so then you could, you, you know, you could scroll down to get more information or you could click in to get further information on the, on the page itself. It's just a, a better user map. So that would be 
that would get rid of, you know, all of these shop, eat, hike. Um, I recommended that they combine events and programs and um, into the same um, area of the website, okay? The other thing I recommended was they took news and uh, some other support and some other information, sorry, and put it into a blog. So we're there posting all kinds of things about the news in a, use, a way that's not maybe user friendly. I would recommend them use a blog. And I actually, and this is essentially, it looks like a blog. I just would uh, improve the user experience a little bit. And I can show you an example that I gave them for their blog instead. And that is startup name. So I gave them this example to use for inspiration for their events and news. So in more of a blog style, just to make it easy. That's great. Yeah, because it's, 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 it's a lot to look at on yes. the other page and it, it's overwhelming, but you also, you need the imagery for the engagement. So it's a, it's a balance for sure. Right. Right, for sure. And and one of the things, um, well, I'll, I'll hold on to that for a second, but um, the other thing is having, we talked with them about, okay, how do you monetize your not-for-profit site a little bit more? So we talked about Bowie Local, uh, because I combine websites with business strategy, because I feel like your website should grow your business for you. It shouldn't just be something that is one and done. It's your new rent. I mean, it's your new storefront. And so it's a different world these days. So we talked about ways that they could monetize their website too, for example. They could have sponsorship tiers that they could offer and um, feature those on the website. They could um, sell the generic web cards, I'm sorry, gift cards for the entire downtown region. Wow. They could also have co-sponsors for the blogs. And one of the things I suggested was, you know, if you're doing a blog about a florist, a wedding planner might want to sponsor that blog. And so they would get cross promotion for those. So there were three ways that I gave them in order to monetize their non not-for-profit site. And I did that with a website audit. It's one of the paid services that we offer at WanderWeb. Um, and it just is an easy way. It, it, it was an easy way for a not profit, not for profit, to get some really low hanging fruit addressed without having to do a whole new web design with a new agency. Yeah, and you know, a whole new website can be a, a big undertaking. And yeah. so, finding ways to to make your what you have more efficient, so that in the future you could invest in a new design at some point, but getting your yourself through the rest of the time. Exactly, because you got to start somewhere. Mm -hmm. And another thing I would like to bring up is Google, you can create a free website on Google. So uh, I sort of have a, a strong recommendation for businesses that are looking to scale to not start with Wix or Squarespace. They're both beautiful, easy to use web design tools. However, they own your website. You don't own your website and you'll be paying a monthly fee. You can get the same tools on Google for free when you create a business page. And so I often recommend businesses start out with that free Google um, option because when you're ready, when you're ready to create your professional website, you'll at least really understand what your business is about. You'll have gone through those growing pains and those pivots that you make. For example, my agency is completely different. The, the services and offers that I thought I would be providing are completely different than what I envisioned I would be providing based upon the things that I love to do and what my customers want and marrying the two together. So you have this vision, like I'm going to give people this great thing and they're going to flock to it. And that's not necessarily the case. And so I would just recommend starting out free um, and then once you've had those growing pains and you're ready to do something with a pro, then explore that. I, I sent a lot of my referrals away, like come back in six to eight months and, you know, try some things. And then, and then we go to do something really amazing for you. But right now I, I don't recommend you do a, a, a new design because we'll have to do a redesign and that's just not good for anybody. So take that advice if you're getting started. I think that is great advice. Um, Christina is asking, is there a standard word count for tags? No. There are for so, meta descriptions, okay. but not for tags. With meta descriptions, it's just like a Facebook post. You don't want it to run off the end. You know, you see the little ellipsis, the dot, dot, mm -hmm. dot. So you definitely want to tidy it up. And I, I think it's 
it's sort of like Twitter, like 260 words or something. I can't remember the number off the top of my head, but there is a limit to what shows. Mm -hmm. um, I'll show you what I mean by that. Um, yeah, I noticed it earlier. Uh, and, and I also like the way that you described the way that people search for things mm -hmm. on the internet because I write out the full questions like how do you blah 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 like right. the full question that I'm asking um and the metadata is always super helpful in terms of like moving through and if I can't read all of it I usually skip it so yes. I would I would type in like how many characters does <laughs> exactly. ideal metadata so do you see this little ellipsis mm -hmm. you've lost an opportunity just front load your information so that your you can read it all at once. See, this is perfect. And I, yeah, I see your metadata it fits perfectly. Thank you. <laughs> so you can see how she's part of the startup space. So that question mark is the end of her metadata right at the top there. So you can see in real world how this is happening. Yeah. Awesome. Rue was wondering if you have any advice about contact forms when you need more information from your visitors. Okay, I do have some pretty specific advice about contact forms. Again, it all goes back to user experience. And I would ask for the bare minimum information that is absolutely necessary for you to do the next step. The more information that you ask for people, just weigh the pros and cons of you're going to have a higher drop-off rate for a non-compete, non-completion for a form. So if you don't need that cell phone number, do not ask for it. If you don't need their last name, don't ask for it. The, my gold standard recommendation is first name, your best email address. And that's what I consistently use, even for myself. I do have, you know, there are some, when people come to me, they're a little bit of a higher value customer. Um, they know that they're probably going to make a serious investment if they work with me, right? And so I do ask a couple more questions mindfully because I really want to vet people coming through and using my time um, efficiently. So that is part of my screening, but I've chosen to do that mindfully, not just because I want the information, I'm actually trying to weed out some people. Yeah, that self-selection can be more helpful than yes. our own judgment. In certain cases, yes, yes. absolutely. Um, Dee is asking, where do you attach image tags and what's the difference with alt tags? So it, it, an image tag, I would ask you to Google it because it's, it's what I call the back end of your website. So usually where you load the images, you have an opportunity to tag the images, name them instead of just, so I'll show you what I mean. So again, I, I'm a big, so if I were to type IMG.0001, I think is what, yes. These are, sorry. Um, IMG, there's, so images automatically get tagged something by your computer, something like image 0001. And what happens is if you look for that, I'm pointing to my screen just so you know. <laughs> right here. If you look, for, if, if you were to um, type that in, you would just see a bunch of random images load that haven't been tagged, right? So that's all you're doing is just tagging it. Um, but what you have to do is in the back end of your website, which is where you develop things, load your images and things like that that's where you would tag your image. The alt tag is just a secondary name for it. You have an opportunity to name it twice and you wanna just do both just for search engine optimization purposes. That all makes sense. Beth says, you mentioned having a blog. I am unfamiliar with how to do that. Do you have any advice? Uh, they are a service provider provider for timber harvesting, excavation, and forestry mowing. So that, those are pretty woodsy blogs to write. <laughs> so, okay. So general, so a blog essentially is a newsletter and I hate the term newsletter. Anybody that comes to me that has a newsletter, I say, you need to find a cool name for it. Like, you know, the green bean or something. I don't know. Right. right? And there'd be Call so it. many good wood puns. That I know, right? I know you could take that in <laughs> any directions. <laughs> yeah. Um, so what I recommend is you come up with something that provides value to your clients. So for example, creating a blog for somebody that does landscaping, you might want to do a seasonal update. 
of, you know, hey, it's time to button up your house for the winter and mow your grass and put the grass clippings. I'm, I don't know, I'm not, I'm not handy. Like we have a gardener, <laughs> like I live in a condo and people come and they take care of these things, but it might be that. So please don't criticize me if I'm telling you bad advice, but, and don't follow this advice. But it's not take, the blog content, it's the, right? <laughs> the, the creation. So take those green pieces of grass and put them over your flower beds so that you, you know, you insulate them for the winter or something. I'm just making, you know, so just tips like that to make them, um, to provide some value and it will improve your search engine optimization because the more often you use those keywords or associated key phrases throughout your website, the more likely you are to be indexed. And you can use it for all of your social media content to drive them back to your website, which is gonna be key as well. So um, a and lot of- Add something before mm -hmm. I- um, so before, uh, when I work with clients, when we create a blog, I actually have a process that I suggest to them. And the first is you write your content and then you repurpose it in as many ways as possible. So you might send that out as an email. You might post it on your social media as micro content, like little pieces from the blog and also do a little video on it. So use it. You should be able to take any content that you create and use it at least five to 10 ways. I think that is great advice. Um, and just... In general, uh, most website, like if you're using a website design template, there's usually like a blog button that you can just add as part of it. So um, definitely check your back end, Beth, to see if it's already an option for you or if you would need to get more follow up information. Thanks. Yes. Um, don't forget to just Google it, how to do it. Mm -hmm. And um, and if it's something complex and there's people out there that you can hire to help you. but you know, you can try it for yourself first. Um, there's so many different ways to do it though. Like if you're on a Squarespace site versus Wix versus Google versus WordPress, I could tell you off the top of my head how to do it on WordPress because I'm a WordPress developer, but I, I wouldn't be able to, you know, it's different based upon the platform that you're on. And I could tell you off the top of my head because I use Square. So yeah. it's fascinating how everybody is just a little bit different. So definitely Google is going to be your best friend in any of these cases. Uh, Denise is saying that they're looking to completely redo their website and it's currently hosted through Vistaprint and they pay a monthly fee. Okay. If they leave that platform, is there a way to take or buy the site name? The domain name? I assume so. So they should, so did they buy the domain name through Vistaprint? Well, let's see. You, I think you should yes, own your yes, domain name. Said, yes. Yep, then you own your domain name. Then, okay, yeah. Well, and so in let me rephrase own. So the way domains work is, remember all those people that had the, the houses on Millinocket that it wasn't their land, but they owned the house on it? No, and then, the, then they sold the land and like people had, to, anyway. Okay, so I'm, I'm making it more complex than it is. But essentially, the domain name is is owned by owned by the world, right? It's sort of like owning land. Somebody could take take it from you at any time. So just keep that in mind. Or you know, one year you pay twelve ninety nine for your domain, and the next year they decide I'm going to charge you four hundred dollars for it. And that's just a risk that you're taking, and everyone is taking that risk. Um, so I wouldn't say that you own your domain; you're holding your domain. That's fair. So there is there are definitely ways to to move it and yes. transfer it around, though, once you have it. Um, well, to be a little technical, what I recommend is just redirecting. So what you would do is actually take that domain and redirect it to your new site. Um, so you um, essentially just would give the internet new directions on what to show when they click on that domain. You might yep. need some professional help with that. Definitely, but uh, that's a good point because especially if people are used to going to a certain place um, and you were to change that, you want to make sure they can still find you. Um, we also, so we have a business advisor wondering, um, if you could show us an example of a Google, of a site built with Google Web Builder, although that's a, that's a big ask in the middle of a live program. So we yeah. can follow up that, but does it offer any SEO advantages because it's Google? No more than any, it might, I mean, Google, okay. So Google is... Um, all right, Google likes to go with what is new and trendy. So for example, Google just rolled out Google Web Stories, just like Instagram Stories, Facebook Stories, et cetera, et cetera. Now, do I think that Google Web Stories is gonna be successful? 
Probably not. It's probably going to go the way of Google Video. Does anybody remember Google Video? <laughs> Me either, right? So, um, so right now, Google has this new website option. It's so new, so new that I don't have a good answer for you yet. Time will tell because it's Google, right? So it may be that Google in a couple years says all, you know, all Google websites are going to be indexed higher than others. I doubt it because that would be something that Google would be considering um, as a decision that would be affected by the search engines. So if some if they're giving people some priority for Google websites and people are hopping off it, then they're not doing themselves a service. So six of one, half a dozen of the other. But I can certainly show you how to create a Google website very quickly. Um, sure, that would be great. <laughs> So what you would do is you would just go to your Google business page. And so if you have not confirmed your own Google business page, that is your second piece of homework for today. Um, you wanna make sure that you have, and I keep losing the correct word, but it's like verifying that it is your Google page. And so this because is that's gonna be the first thing that pops up when someone Googles you. Mm -hmm. The other thing is, is testimonials are so mm -hmm. important. So you can send out a review request with your link. So basically when you're on your Google business page, uh, doo -doo -doo -doo, can actually go in to your Google business page itself. We are quite literally getting the back end. <laughs> So when you're within here, you actually will have a tab on the left that says website, and you can just click on that and create your website. When you're setting up your page, they'll give you the option of setting it up. Um, so one of the questions I sort of missed in that was, does it say Google in the name, or do you also choose your own domain in the same way that you would if you were using a different uh, platform? Yep, you would, use your, um, you would use your Google domain, like, or your domain like you would with any other platform. And by the way, um, creating when you're searching for domains, Google domains is the best search engine to find. I don't necessarily think they're the best way to buy, but Google domains has the best options. A good place to do your research. Yes. And then you can go elsewhere to buy things based on pricing. Um, but it's kind of like how you should do your research on Amazon, but then buy it directly from the business. Mm -hmm. It's that same kind of, use the, use the option to learn as much as you can. So that's how I found WanderWeb when I was naming my business is I went, I was playing with all of these different words and I typed in WanderWeb. And so you can go through and see, mm -hmm. you know, all the different options that you could use for your business. And for me, I mean, common sense, the WanderWeb was $12.99 a year and WanderWeb.com was $3,000. So I chose to save $1,000 a letter and go with the WanderWeb, right? But I wouldn't have known any of that if I hadn't gone onto Google Domains. And it's just the most robust. You can go into GoDaddy or any of the other ones, but that's probably my recommendation for when you're looking for a name. And it seems like the sort of attitudes have changed and fluctuated throughout this, but how do you feel about the the end of a website? Does it have to be .com? Does it have to be .org? Does it have to be .me? Like, what, do you, what are you seeing as, as working? It's still .com. It okay. really is, yeah. Um, if for, certainly for non, not-for-profits or nonprofits, the .org is a good fit. Um, and I actually snagged my .org domain just for trademarking. Mm -hmm. um, and that's another thing that you can do is, is buy all those other domains while they're cheap and associated with your name, just in case you ever want to trademark. Thank you for that. There aren't any other questions in the chat. So if you had any, pop them in there real quick. But this was wonderful. Thank you so much, Corey. And thank you everyone for joining us. I hope that this helped clarify some you know, basics to get you moving. Remember, you will receive a follow-up email from me probably this afternoon that has a link to the recording. So if there was anything you missed, you can go back um, as well as the resources um, and, and I'm just going uh, contact to, information. 
I'm just going to drop the, my freebie in the chat. All right. Um, okay, so it's the, a, a list of the 14 things I want you to check for your website. Um, so I'll nice. drop that in there. We're getting lots of thank yous in the chat. So, oh, wonderful! Thank, thank you, everybody. Yous to I everyone. It, I hope it was valuable. Um, I certainly really love to uh, provide this education. So, just need to. I feel like I learn stuff, and it is interesting that Z pattern is uh, for your, <laughs> for the record, that advising request button is right at the end of the top of the Z <laughs> on our website. So it. That's, job, we did it. We did it. <laughs> here. So you should get a file in the chat um, that you will be able to access. However, I will make sure that that is also in the follow-up email. And generally, there this was go. wonderful. Awesome. Thank you so much, everybody. And I wish you lots of luck on your business, your small business journey. And I hope that the lack of sleep that you're getting is from excitement and not stress. I know, right? Um, I don't see anything in the chat yet. Did, did, He's sleeping right now. Oh, perfect. So we'll all just, you know, spend our, these last two minutes. Everybody <laughs> take a deep breath. You made it almost halfway through the day. We are more than halfway through the week. We're getting free downloads and optimizing our website. We are ahead of the curve. And it looks like the PDF just popped through. Cool. Take care, everybody. Oh, yeah. So you should be able to save that to your computer. I'll stay on for a couple minutes just so everyone has time to access that. Uh, but otherwise, thank you all so much and have a lovely day.